Hi, this is Misha, and today we're going to take a little look at uh, kind of a famous rifle from the 1980s. This is the Armor Light AR-180, which is the semi-automatic version of the Armor Light AR-18. Now, most all of my military, most all of my collection is with military guns, and the, the AR-18, the AR-180 tried really hard to be a military gun, but was actually never officially adopted by anyone. That said, it's, it's, it's paved the way for a lot of later, later guns. It had a lot of advanced features for its day and time. Well, this gun's roots can be traced back to the early 1960s, after Armalite sold off the AR-15 design, and after Eugene Stoner went to work for Colt, George Sullivan and Arthur Miller went to work on a new design to kind of compete with the Colt gun and just uh, try to make something a little bit better than the AR-15. What they came up with was the AR-18. It was based on Stoner's last design he had been tinkering with over at Armorlite called the AR-16 which was in uh, 762 NATO 308. But the AR-18, like the AR-15, was chambered for the then new 223 Remington, later to be called 556 NATO cartridge. Now, because of patents, you know, Colt held the patents for the AR-15, so Armalite had to be kind of clever and use different designs and, and do, you know, go through that. So what we have here, we'll start from the muzzle as usual. We have a open-ended, three-pronged style flash hider, screwed on to standard half by 28 threads. We have an 18-inch long barrel with a 1 in 12 twist rate. This is not chrome-lined. We have a bayonet lug here, standard sling swivel. Oh, by the way, this takes a standard M16, M7, M9 type bayonet. Standard protected front post sight. Now this has a gas piston system, which we'll get back to in a second, but it's not a direct impingement like the AR-15, it is actually a, um, a gas piston, it's a short recoil. That taps a bolt back here with a reciprocating charging handle. This is a seven roll uh, lug rotating bolt, not dissimilar to that used in the AR-15. As you can see, it does have a last round hold back. There is actually no release though, so, to get rid of that, you need to drop your mag out. Let it go back and forth. It fed from 20 round detachable magazines originally. These are not straight interchangeable with AR-15 because of the slot in the side. The mag catch is a little bit different. Very similar style, but a little bit different. We have a quick detaching scope base mount on top of the receiver here for our QD mount. We have windage adjustable rear sight with this knob. It also has two flip apertures. We have a side folding to the left polymer stock. It just snaps in there. Pull it when you're ready to deploy. neat design, very thin stock. It doesn't add a lot of, um, that's, uh, I guess you'd say, width to the gun when folded. Not unlike the more modern Honey Badger or the Sig Sauer MCX, actually, in that whole idea of having a very skinny folding stock. We also have an AR-style safety here. However, it's also ambidextrous. It's duplicated on the right side. And the reason they did that was so you could still use the safety even with the stock folded. Pretty advanced gun for its day and time. This carrier, this bulk carrier actually rides on two guide rods, not one, so it prevented the whole carrier tilt issue, which would plague later piston-driven AR-15s. Kind of forward thinking of them. 
So yeah, they, they designed these guns. Not only did this have a lot of unique features for its day, what they were trying to go for was a less expensive alternative to the AR-15. Whereas the AR used a lot of forgings and machined parts, the AR-18 was built with uh, stamped and welded, folded over type receivers. We have a lot of cast parts like the cocky handle here. Their sight base up here is cast and um, a lot of simplified stampings. The, the trigger groups in these are actually stamped, which explains why actually the trigger is not very fantastic. Quite heavy, not bad, not too crunchy, but very heavy on these. I felt some that are a little better. Some not. This has Bakelite style furniture. Quite an ergonomic grip, nice swept back type grip, especially for the 60s rubber butt pad, butt pad on that, kind of rounded off square type hand guards, not unlike the early AR-15 hand guards with holes. We have a dust cover here to protect the action when it's not needed. All right, so by 1964, Armalat had some advanced prototypes ready to go, and the U.S. military did, um, did try them out, but that didn't go very far. By 1964, the U.S. Air Force had already adopted the AR-15 as the M-16, and the U.S. Army had already ordered some sample XM-16E1s for, for field use and testing, so they were pretty well set on the AR. Nevertheless, they did try out the AR-18, but it didn't go very far. One of the biggest issues they ran into was that the cyclic rate was so high, and the magazines it was using originally couldn't quite feed fast enough so you'd have jams because the mag couldn't feed fast enough to meet the bolt so you'd have the bolt closing on an empty chamber and then the, 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 it would stop. Other issues, the gun was just had some weak points. This folding stock hinge is not terribly strong on these. You can see the welds here. So the military discovered that would, you know, could be beaten and, and broken quite easily. Just some little things like that that honestly could have been rectified with a version, like an A1 version, if they went back to the drawing board for six months, they could have fixed it. Of course, it has the early style three-prong hider, which they could have gone to a birdcage easily, easily enough, things like that. But it was mostly just because the U.S. military had already settled on the AR-15. So what Armalite did, they kept improving the design. They went to a new style of magazine. And in 1969, they introduced the AR-180, this gun here, a semi-automatic version. Initially, these were made at the Costa Mesa facility in California. And between 1969 and 1972, Armalite would produce just over 4,000 AR-180s and just under 1,200 AR-18s in Costa Mesa. But they weren't a manufacturing facility, they were an idea facility. So they contracted with Hawa of Japan, who was producing guns in World War II, by the way, to produce the AR-18 and AR-180 for them. So between 1970 and 1974, Hawa would produce just under 4,000 AR-180s. What happened there that soured that deal, the Japanese government stepped in and forbade Hawa from selling to the USA because of the Vietnam War and, and other issues. So that didn't last very long, but by 1974, the Hawa guns were over. And that brings us to the gun I'm holding here. This is a British Sterling produced AR-180. Around 1975, Armor Light and Sterling signed a contract for them to produce the gun. Production was up and running by 1979, and by 1985, thereabouts, Sterling had turned out over 12,000 of these. So most of the Armor Lights are going to be Sterlings. In total, there are about 20,300 were made. So a very small number. To put that in perspective, the, um, the 1941 Johnson they made only 25,000 of, so even more. Not by much, but a little bit. The Colt SP-1, they made at least 250,000 of. So there were more SP-1s, about 11 to 1, compared to the AR-180. So it's, even though these rifles are quite common, they didn't actually make that many. 
So these didn't see military service, but they were tried out by the British SAS, and they actually influenced a whole generation of later guns, especially this gas system. It became very popular. Um, Hawa in Japan, even though they quit making in 1974, would actually use elements of this gun in the Type 89 assault rifle, which is current issue in Japan today. Sterling in Britain would actually go out of business in 1985 or 1986, somewhere in that era. But the, um, the AR-180 would actually inspire the L-85, the, the British bullpup made by Enfield. Both the gas system and the bolt group were, were almost direct copies. Also, the, the German G-36 and HK-416 use a very similar gas system and bolt system. Even newer guns like the, uh, the Beretta ARX-100 have clear AR-118 inspirations. As I've said in one other video, the AR-18 was the velvet underground of the gun world, and I still think that's a very apt comparison. It's just um, it influenced, like I said, a whole generation. And also, like everyone who, who made one or really tried them out ended up using parts of it in later designs, even though it wasn't a huge commercial success. Well, these were bought en masse by Americans, civilians. They were also bought by the American uh, law enforcement scene because the AR-15 was kind of perceived as the Vietnam gun. It had a bit of a stigma. Also, it was more expensive. These were affordable. And about the only other weapon of this style in the market at the time was the Mini-14, and this gun was more accurate than it was. So these were popular. I know the New, the New Orleans Police Department had some of these back in the late 70s and early 80s. Of course, no AR-18 video was complete without mentioning of the IRA, who had as many as 2,000 of these and deemed them the Widowmaker. A lot of people assume that the, the Irish guns were actually made by Sterling. This doesn't seem to be the case. It seems like most likely they were either Costa Mesa or Hawa. Most sources I've seen said Hawa. But the time Sterling was making these, the IRA really wasn't um, obtaining them any longer. So that's kind of why. But yeah, to look at the three manufacturers, this one, as I said, is a Sterling. They were the last manufacturer. And a lot of people kind of look down on the Sterlings, but I, I like them for their British connection. This one here has the black paint finish called Stoving by the Brits. About the first 5,000 had this, and then the last 7,000 had a, a kind of a matte blue finish. Sterling did do some improvements to the design as well. They added some extra welds back here where the stock's at, and also throughout the receiver up here, the plates have a little more welding around them. Here and here. So they did try to do a few minor improvements to the design to make it stronger. Several types of mags were used with the AR-18 and AR-180. This is the original pattern sent with the commercial like Costa Mesa in Howa guns. It very much resembles the AR-15 20 round mag of the Vietnam era. It is straight. It is made out of an aluminium alloy body. This side is smooth. It has the cut for the AR-18 mag catch here, and that's it, no other cuts. This is an original Armalite. This is actually military surplus. I have no idea exactly how I got it. This, this mag actually came from Newmark when they had them. Got little rivet, rivets in the front here. But yeah, this was the original mag. Sterling introduced an improved mag. This is their 20 rounder. Unlike the one you just looked at, this one's made of steel. Thin steel, but steel, not alloy. It's curved, has kind of a curved feed. And it has the AR-18 cut in the side. It also has an AR-15 cut out, so it'll work with both AR-15s and AR-18s, which was a big selling point in the 80s when someone went to buy mags. If they owned both guns, they, they could buy them a Sterling mag. The guns are usually shipped with two of these. They are good, reliable mags. They're usually phosphated, rubberized. Some are painted. But probably Sterling's biggest contribution, the one they're most famous for, is 
their 40 round mag. Turn it right way up. Now this is made just like their um, just like their 20, except obviously it's a lot longer, a lot bigger. Still made of steel. Still fits either AR-15 or AR-18. And uh, these are probably among the best 40 round mags in 223 made back in the 80s. They were actually reliable. Most of the ones made for the AR-15 back in that era sucked. They, um, they were commercial, they weren't military, and they weren't made to, to really work or last. They were just meant to look cool. An exception to this would be HK 40 round mags for the HK 93. Those have always worked really well. But other than that, the Sterling AR-18, AR-15 mag was about it. So yeah, that was Sterling's. The Howa guns actually had kind of a gray-green phosphate finish and um, are generally considered of the best quality. They, they tend to have very clean welds, very well done. However, they have a few oddities. For one, for some reason the bayonet lugs were made slightly out of spec, so aren't really usable most of the Howell guns, not without being modified at least. Also, for some reason, the park seems like it wears exceedingly easily. I've seen a lot of um, Howells that had 60-70% park on them that had great internals that didn't look like they were shot that much, but the park had just rubbed off. I'm not sure exactly if it was the treatment or a type of park or too thin or just they were used heavily, but I have seen a lot of Howells with, with quite a bit of wear. And then finally, the original, the Costa Mesa guns, they were also parkerized. These are probably the most desirable just because they're the American ones, they're the original, they're the ones that were actually made in-house by Armalite. As I said though, Armalite wasn't a manufacturer, they were more of an idea center. They didn't have a full, you know, factory set up. So the Costa Mesa guns are going to have kind of signs of hand fitting and, and you know, hand worked tooling and, and things like that. They, they're almost, you know, a one-off shop. So the guns that the 4,000 or so they made all looked a smidge different because of how they were done. And of course, they were never meaning to make the gun on their own. They were just shopping around for someone to uh, make them for them at the time anyway. So that's kind of a rundown of the semi-autos. Again, I like the Sterling. They are the more affordable, of course. So that's always nice that you can go out and shoot it. And I've shot this one quite a bit. Never had a problem out of it. Very reliable, very accurate. It's actually very comfortable. It's not very heavy, but um, I always like these. Take a little look at it, huh? Internally. But set the mag over here. These field strip very easily. Now, one failure point on these. Get two. It's actually the bolt hold open. A lot of times when you find these, the bolt hold open is broken. So when you crack your gun open, make sure your hammer is cocked back. And for double safety, have the safety on. Because if this hammer comes forward and hits this bolt hold open device right here, it will break it. And good luck replacing it. These are exceedingly hard to replace. No one makes parts. So just a little tip there if you're going to disassemble. But as you see, it comes apart very easily. It does have a removable pivot pin in the front here, much like the early Colt 601 AR-15s. This is your, um, your bolt group here. As you see, you've got a double guide rod spring. Now I'm also holding the upper hand guard because what holds this on is actually your uh, recoil springing guide. So once you take that off, your hand, your upper hand guard comes right off, and you can see the um, the heat me hitting the table. You can see the uh, rather famous AR-15 gas piston system right here. This has been copied in a lot of guns. This is typical uh, short stroke gas piston. Take your bolt out, so pull this back to the hole in the receiver, 
pull your handle off, and your bolt carrier just slides out the back. This is an AR-180 bolt carrier, as you can see it's very square. It disassembles very easily, it just has a pin right here, see, you just pull it out, and it comes apart very much like an AR-15 carrier. This actually has a spring-loaded firing pin, which is different from an AR-15. If anyone owns a Bushmaster XM, or excuse me, M17S, you'll notice this carrier looks very similar to it, as it is. Yeah, that is about all you need. This gas piston does come out very easily. It's actually a few pieces. I'm not going to pull it out, but it does come apart very easily if you need to uh, take it apart. you got the internal halves here. Solid rolled steel. As I said, this hammer is actually stamped, as you can see. Pretty typical trigger group. But yeah, that was the uh, Armorlite 180. The semi automatic version of the Armor Light AR 18. And this is a classic 80s gun. Obviously, most of you know that this was in Terminator and several other films. Hollywood liked them because there were a lot of pre May 86 registered examples that fired in full auto. It's just a neat gun, and it's one of the very few guns in my collection that wasn't actually military issued by anyone directly, but it's just it's so neat and iconic and has a lot of neat features. Now, there, was, there has been a newer version made. In, um, in 1995, Eagle Arms bought out the Armalite name, and uh, from 2003 to about 2008, they made the AR-180B, which had a very similar upper and gas system, but it had a polymer lower with a fixed buttstock attached to it. The, the AR-180Bs, they're reliable, but they had problems with the polymer lowers cracking, so today most people kind of look for the original the classics from the 80s and uh, be it Costa Mesa, Howa, or Sterling, these are all really neat guns. They are reliable, they're quite accurate, they take, um, they take some standard parts. Mags aren't too hard to find for them, they're not common, but they're out there. This is an original Sterling sling, for, by the way, for it. It's uh, like a two-point GI sling, but it has these metal tabs on the end as opposed to just the end of the canvas, which is kind of neat. The earlier custom mazes and howlers had more of an M14 style sling with the clip. But uh, yeah, just thought we'd share it today. This has kind of made little sneak peeks in other videos of ours, but I wanted to uh, dedicate a few minutes to it because it definitely deserves it, and it's definitely one of the neat, sometimes overlooked pre band guns from the 80s. But, uh, if you have any questions, please post them below my best to answer them and uh, as always I really appreciate it thanks for tuning in